Good. All right. Uh, before we begin uh, the word, our study in the Word of God today, I just encourage you to bow your heads with me as we begin with prayer. Dear gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we just pray that you speak to our hearts, and Lord, may we just lose sight of the messenger and focus on the message. And Lord, we just ask that you revive us before it is too late, Father. Help us to reach a dying world who does not know you. Oh Lord, please place your words in my mind and speak through me to your people. Convict our hearts of sin. Transform us and make us like the lovely Jesus. Please free us from distractions now, and we just ask that your holy angels abide in this place, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, it's been a few years since I've actually received a handwritten letter. Have you ever received a handwritten letter in the, in the past four or five years? Maybe just one or two, right? Yes. Um, you know, when I get a letter like that, I want to read it, because I know someone took their time to write to me. Imagine if you got a, a letter from God, a letter from Jesus. Would you open it? Would you read it? Would you do the things that Jesus told you to do, even if it kind of cuts your heart a little bit? Would you? You know, I would be excited if I had a letter from Jesus. You know, in my hands today, brothers and sisters, I actually have that letter written to you. It is a love letter, and it's called a love letter to Laodicea. And that is the title of our message today, Love Letter to Laodicea. I encourage you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, as we open this letter together, brothers and sisters. Revelation chapter 3. And I'm going to begin in verse 14. And this letter writes in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. This letter here is written to the church of Laodicea, which is the last church um, out of these seven churches. There's a letter to seven churches. And this letter goes to the last church that is, a, that is existing before Jesus Christ comes. And here it's written to uh, the church of Laodicea. Does anyone know by chance? What does the word Laodicea mean? Lukewarm. All right, anyone else want to share anything? A people judged. Yes, um, a people judged. Uh, I've heard both of those, but um, are we living in this time of judgment? Yes, right, the first angel's message says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and that time is now. And so, brothers and sisters, this letter was written to you and to me. And it was written, if you have a red letter edition Bible, it was, it, was, it was spoken by Jesus. In fact, he calls himself the faithful and true witness. And if you were to skip to Revelation 1 to 5, we won't go there right now, but Jesus himself calls himself the faithful and true witness. I have a jury duty coming up next week, and uh, they might have a witness in the case if, if I'm going to be picked. But, um, you know, a witness, they, they promise to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But you know, people still lie sometimes, right? But Jesus, he doesn't lie. Because the book of Titus chapter 1, verse 2 tells us that God cannot lie. And so this letter, this testimony to us today, to you and to me, is 100% true. Now we know perhaps a little bit about um, the Laodicean church. We know that Jesus speaks this letter, and, and we know these things, but um, after that, do we know much more about this letter? Actually, most of us, we just kind of zip up our Bible, and we go to the next chapter, right? 
we don't know too much about what this letter actually means to us today. I encourage you to um, go to verse 15. Uh, Jesus here says to us in Revelation 3.15, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Here is a church that thinks they are all right. But brothers and sisters, they're all wrong. If you notice in this letter, you know, we, we are, today we're talking about who is on the Lord's side, right? And we know our church, sometimes we have some problems going on. We have some debates on ordination. We have a debate on worship music. We have a debate on this and that. And it, there's a temptation in the church to look at other people and say, you know what, that sister over there, she's cold. She's lukewarm. That brother over there, you see how he acts, how he talks, how he dresses? He's Laodicea but not me. I'm on the Lord's side. But you know what, friends? Jesus, in this letter, he does not say, I know her works. He does not say, I know his works. You know what he says? He says, I know your works. He's talking directly to us. And so this letter is not to those bad people in the church over there. It's not to the people in the world over there. It's to you. And it's to me. He says, I know your works. What does he mean? That we are naked, poor, miserable, wretched, and blind. Is this literal? Obviously not, right? Are you literally blind? Are you literally naked? I hope not. Um, obviously, this must be spiritual then. But what does it mean? You know, uh, we're told in Great Controversy, page 6, or excuse me, 598, that the language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning, unless a symbol or figure is employed. But we don't guess as Seventh-day Adventists, right? Is that what you want? You want to hear a, a nice preacher tell you what these things mean by his own interpretation? No. Amen? You want to see from the Bible what this message means to you. Amen? And so man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, we need to compare word to word, scripture to scripture, to see what these things mean to us. You know, Jesus sp speaks words for a specific reason. He uses language for a specific reason. He does not waste his words. So what does it mean? If you look here, he says uh, in Revelation chapter 3 that we are wretched verse 17. You know, if you look up the word wretched in the Bible, in the Greek, that word wretched, it only takes you to one other location in the Bible. You know that? Amen, Brother Miller. And it takes you to Romans chapter 7. Do you think God would want us to go there? I think so. Let's go there, brothers and sisters. Romans chapter 7. What does it mean to be wretched? We need the Bible to tell us exactly what it means. Romans chapter 7, and starting in verse 19. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, chapter 7, starting in verse 19. And listen to the, um, the experience of Paul. In Romans, chapter 7, starting in verse 19, we want to know what it means to be wretched. He says, For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Then he says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I'm thankful for that next verse. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, 
our Lord. You know, friends, here he says, he, exp he explains his wretched condition, and his wretched condition was simply this. He wanted to do good. He wanted to keep the commandments of God, but he kept fa falling back into sin. Does that sound like our experience? Yes, it does. Isn't that right? That is a wretched condition. You know, when Jesus says that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, he doesn't say or, which means we're not just one of these five categories. We're all five. Here we understand what it means to be wretched. We are struggling in sin. What does it mean to be miserable? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You know, if you look up that word miserable, it also only shows up one time in the New Testament. And it's right there in 1 Corinthians 15. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to be begin in verse um, 19. And I'm going to explain this to you a little bit. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, he says, If then in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most, and the New King James says, pitiable, but that word actually is miserable. And it's the only time it shows up. What is he talking about here? Well, if you read the chapter, he's talking about um, some who say that there is no resurrection of the dead. You can see that in verse 12. And he says, look, if, if, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then our faith is useless. And if our faith is useless, we have no hope in Christ, we have no hope of the resurrection. And so what he's saying is, look, if you, if you believe in a resurrection, but there is no resurrection, then you have a false hope, and you are the most miserable people in the world, because you have a false hope. What it means to be miserable, brothers and sisters, is that we have a false hope. A false hope. And what that means is that if we think we're going to be resurrected in the right resurrection, but if we remain in our lukewarm condition, we will not come up in the right resurrection. You know, friends, this is a serious matter. Um, many of us, we, we look at that Romans verse and we say, yes, that's us. But hey, when Jesus comes, I'm going to be a whole different person. No more sin anymore, praise God. That's what I used to think. <laughs> Until I read Adventist Home, page 16, which says, if you would be a saint in heaven, you must first be a saint on this earth. The traits of character you cherish will not be changed by death or by the resurrection. You will come up from the grave with the same disposition you manifested in the home and in society. Jesus does not change the character at his coming. The work of transformation must be done now. And brothers and sisters, that's not just Ellen White, because you can find it in the Bible in Revelation chapter 22, verse 11, which says, Jesus himself declares, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he who is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. Jesus says, in this life, we determine our destiny. I want to, um, for the sake of time, skip a few of these divine diagnoses, and uh, Sister Nora, please keep me on time here. But I want to, um, don't worry, brothers and sisters, there is good news in this sermon, amen? <laughs> it is coming up. Stay with me, amen? <laughs> I want to look at one more thing, and then we're going to go, see, not, the wonderful thing about Jesus is not only does he tell us we have problems, but he gives us a solution. Amen, brother? That's right. All right, so I want to look at one more thing, and then we're going to go to the cure. So one more divine di uh, diagnosis. He calls us blind. He calls us blind. Now, um, I encourage you, uh, if, in fact, if you go there, I'm going to have to, I can't find it in my notes, so I'm going to have to go to the Bible verse. In Revelation chapter 3, he calls us Blind of verse 17. What does Jesus mean by blind? Well, you could say spiritually blind, perhaps, but I encourage you to go to Matthew chapter 23, because here again, Jesus uses the same word, blind. And what does that mean? 
Matthew chapter 23. Here Jesus says he's talking about, uh, he's, he's, he's giving the woes to the, the Pharisees in, in, in Matthew 23. And if you notice in verse uh, 16 of Matthew 23, he says, Woe to you blind guides. Verse 17, fools and blind. And verse 19, fools and blind. And what does he say? He's saying when he's say, calling them blind, why are they so blind? Well, if we continue to read in verse 23, he says, Woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of anise and mint and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. The hypocrites, uh, the Pharisees were blind, but they were blind to their own hypocrisy. Now you're saying, Brother Will, I don't like this message at all. In fact, it's cutting right to our hearts. Saying, oh, we really, we, we love to talk about those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. The question is, do we really keep the commandments of God? Do we have the faith of Jesus? Perhaps you see yourself as blind. As some, you, have, you come to church, you can say happy Sabbath. You can say, uh, you can bring your vegetarian dish for potluck. You can bring all these things and have your nice suit on. You can practice health reform and dress reform. But Jesus says we need more than health reform. We need more than dress reform. Jesus says you need heart reform, brothers and sisters. And so thankfully, the message does not end right there. In fact, let's go to the cure, friends. Go back to Revelation chapter 3. What is it Jesus tells us that we need? Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. Jesus says in Revelation 3, 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. What does that mean? Golden faith and love. That's right, my brother. He's already... <laughs> I was going to break that down for the Bible, but he already got it. All right, good. Amen. Um, you know, one interesting thing here, Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me this, this, this. The wonderful thing here, brothers and sisters, is that everything we need, Jesus has. Amen. Everything we need, Jesus says. And when he says, buy it, you know, you look in Isaiah and he says, come buy without money and without Christ. You could be a million dollars in debt today, friends but you can still have the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ because you cannot buy salvation because Jesus already paid it all. Amen? What does it mean? You know, before I go there, I want to share this one quote. Perhaps you feel that you're not on the Lord's side today. If so, I want to share some, a quote, an encouraging quote, Steps to Christ, page 64. Ellen White says this, the closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. For your vision will be clearer, and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. She says, this is evidence that Satan's delusions have lost their power, and the vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you. You know, if you say today, yes, Lord, I am naked. Yes, Lord, I am miserable. Yes, Lord, I'm wretched. I'm struggling with this sin. Yes, Lord, that's me. She says, the closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you appear in your own sight. Amen? Isn't that encouraging, friends? So what is this gold refined in the fire? How many more minutes do I have? Ten minutes? All right. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. Very quickly. We can't look at all the remedies today, but we will look at at least one. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. I'm going to start in verse 6, actually, just to complete the sentences. It says, 
In this you greatly rejoice, though for an, a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here, the Apostle Peter, he compares faith to gold. And he says it's tested by fire. So this gold, we, it's interesting that Jesus also says gold we find in a fire. Um, what does that mean? Well, he compares the gold to faith, but I want to read to you, uh, a dear brother already told us what it means, but Christ's Object Lessons, page 158. She says, the gold tried in the fire is faith that works by love. Only this can bring us into harmony with God. We may be active, we may do much work, but without love, such love as dwelt in the heart of Christ, we can never be numbered with the family of heaven. She says, the gold tried in the fire is a faith that works by love. A faith that works by love. It's not just gold, but it's gold we find what? Based on 1 Peter. It's refined in the fire. What does that mean? Well, go to uh, Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah 48. Have you ever wondered why you, you when you want to be a Christian, you have so many problems? <laughs> uh, am I the only one? I don't think so, right? Uh, why is it when I want to do good, then it's like more bad things happen and, you know, just more things going out once, it's, everything's calling for your attention, uh, and you pray, and you pray and you say, Lord, take away these trials. Have you ever prayed that? Lord, take away this trial. And you pray that prayer, and guess what happens? Nothing happens. Nothing happens when you pray, Lord, take away this trial. And you're like, Lord, you are all powerful. Why? Isaiah 48, verse 10. God says this, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. What are you saying, Brother Will? I'm saying this, Desire of Ages, page 301. Through affliction, God reveals to us the plague spots in our characters that by his grace we may overcome our faults. It says, when he permits trials and afflictions, it is for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. You know, have you ever read in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 2 to 3, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. You know, you can't have patience unless someone is testing your patience, right? Do you see that trials produce what? Patience. Affliction, it tests us, it refines our character, it shows the evil in our nature so that we may take it to Christ and be cleansed. God permits trials and tribulations and difficulties in our life. Why? Because he wants us to be partakers of his holiness. And he wants to show us, look, you need me. You need me through everything. James 1, 2. It says, My brethren, count all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Have you never read, Here is the patience of the saint? Brothers and sisters, do you know why there's so many trials going on in your life right now? It's because Jesus is trying to develop the patience of the saints in you. Jesus says, I want you to be more and more like the lovely Jesus. We pray, Lord, take these trials away from me. But Jesus says, I cannot remove these trials from you, my daughter. I cannot remove these trials from you, my son. Because these trials are the very thing which is necessary to prepare you for the time of trouble that you may be safe. God knows what he's doing. Amen? <laughs> I want to close with uh, uh, these two things. I believe I have five minutes. Yes, okay. Go to Revelation chapter 15, verse 2. 
Revelation 15. Will we really, I mean, are we really going to be overcomers before Jesus comes? Revelation chapter 15, verse 2 gives us the answer. Because John saw a class of people. And he says in verse 2, And I saw something like the sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who had the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. This is the final class that makes it through the final trials. Do you understand, brothers and sisters, that John might have saw you in that class? Don't you want to be part of that class, friends? Do you know that Jesus wants you to be part of that class? He gave everything for us. Perhaps we say, Lord, I am too wretched. Lord, I'm too sinful. Lord, I don't think I can overcome. That's where you're wrong, friends, because your hope is not in yourself. It is in Jesus Christ. In his power, we will overcome not by might nor by power, but by the Holy Spirit indwelling in us as we surrender ourselves to him. Today, Jesus has an appeal to us. He says, if you are discouraged by a burden of sin, if you are discouraged by trials, know that Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. Do you think that you're too unworthy to enter into heaven? Jesus says, you're the very class I died for. It is my righteousness that covers you. Today's appeal is found in Revelation chapter 3. Go there, our last verse. Jesus' appeal to us today is this. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, Jesus says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also have overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. Today I want to, um, we are out of time, brothers and sisters, but let us close in prayer. Will you please bow your heads with me as we close in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, today you are saying that we are not ready for your coming, but you want to make us ready. And Lord, if there is someone here today, as all heads are bowed and eyes are closed, who says, Lord, that is me. I am naked. I am not clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Lord, my faith has drifted. Lord, I am spiritually blind. Lord, I am wretched. I keep trying to overcome, but I can't. it seems like I can't. Today you want to say, Lord, give me the strength and the power. Enter into my heart, Father. Take my heart, for I cannot give it. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. If there was someone here today who has uh, perhaps grown up in the church but walked away, but today they say, Lord, I want to follow you wherever you go. As all heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if there's someone who wants to return to the lovely Jesus, would you just raise your hand? I'd like to pray for you. Anyone here who says, I want to return to the lovely Jesus. Perhaps you grew up in the church, but you walked away. Also, is there someone here who has not yet made a decision for Christ? Perhaps they'd like to make a decision for baptism today. Is there someone here actually who would like to be baptized or rebaptized? Come up to the front, my brother. Come here. God bless you. Yes, that is what I'm talking about. <laughs> Let me give you a hug, my brother. What is your name? Christopher. Christopher. God bless you. Um, can someone get Christopher's name? Anyone else here who says, I want to stand for Jesus like Christopher today? Anyone else here today? Have an amen for Brother Christopher, amen? Uh, what, church, what church do you attend, my brother? Um, or you don't attend the church yet? No, 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 no church. Okay, who's your friends here? Did you come with a friend? Mm, okay, friend. okay, great. Do you want to attend a church somewhere, my sister? A big church. A different church. Okay. I would like someone... I, um, there's got to be a pastor here. Can I just ask a pastor to speak with Christopher after the service? Um, that's what I'd like. God bless you. Thank you for coming up. Someone else, anyone else would like to be uh, 
make a decision for Christ today. If not, let, 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 us, uh, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for Christopher. I thank you for those individuals who raised their hands. And Lord, we thank you for your great love. That there is no greater love than you gave for us. That you gave everything. All heaven was poured out in one gift. In the sacrifice of your son for me. For everyone here. And Lord, we just pray that you help us to be ready for your coming. Please, Lord, especially be with Christopher. Make him a strong servant in Jesus Christ and use him to reach thousands of people for you, Lord. Father, we ask for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit on all of us. Forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, my Lord. God bless you. All right, thank you.